Chapter 19 is blood vessels. And in the world of blood vessels, we have a number of different types based on where they're taking the blood and what they're doing with it. Here we have an overall view of, we start with the idea of the heart, and then blood goes out in arteries. Then it goes through some smaller and smaller vessels ending in capillary beds, then back into veins and back to the body, back to the heart. We also have the lymph system in here as well, and we'll get to that in the next chapter. But it's going to be directly involved in cardiovascular system function as well. If we look at the two main vessels here, we talk about arteries and we talk about veins. And the difference, as we can start to see here, between an artery and a vein is one from a functionality standpoint. And that is arteries always carry oxygen away, or rather carry blood, away from the heart. Veins always carry blood back towards the heart. There is a common statement out there that says that arteries always have high oxygen blood and veins have low oxygen blood, and that's usually the case, with the exception of the pulmonary arteries would actually have low blood oxygen levels, and the pulmonary veins would have high oxygen levels. What always holds true, though, is the direction of blood flow. So arteries always carry blood away from the heart, and veins always carry blood back towards it. If we look at these drawings here, we see that the arteries have a great deal of muscle. And when we look at the veins, they have a much thinner layer of muscle around them. But their internal volume is about the same. So again, the difference structurally is the amount of muscle that's present. And the muscle is there in arteries because it has a higher blood pressure. It needs more muscle to contain that pressure of blood. Veins have a much lower blood pressure, so that requires a much lesser amount of muscle to contain that blood. If we start with arteries leading away from the heart, what we discover are two different kinds of arteries. Our first one here is an elastic artery. An elastic artery, we can look here and see it has a little bit of skin, a little bit of elastic tissue, but it's mostly smooth muscle and then a little bit of fibrous tissue on the inside of that. So mostly muscle and less of the other items. Our total diameter there is about one and a half centimeters in diameter. So these are not necessarily gigantic, but they are certainly the largest of internal diameter. The elastic part of their name comes from, and why they have a significant amount of elastic tissue as well, is that these are the arteries closest to the heart, so they then have the highest blood pressures that they experience. In an elastic artery, it is elastic, so when the heart contracts and pushes blood, the artery stretches. Then when the heart relaxes and refills with blood, the artery constricts back down. So it's very elastic in that it's stretching, it's contracting, it's stretching and contracting to accommodate those dramatic changes in blood pressure. So elastic arteries are those that experience dramatic highs, dramatic lows, and blood pressure. And so you uh, sort of balance that out with that elasticity. Muscular arteries, we see here, get smaller. Their composition is more smooth muscle than the other components. And what we see here is that elastic tissue is still there, but in much less quantity. So a muscular artery's job is not so much to expand and contract, but to maintain a relatively fixed diameter, and that helps to maintain blood pressure as you get farther away from the heart. So elastic arteries needed to adapt to blood pressure. Muscular arteries need to maintain blood pressure. And you do that by being relatively inflexible. Muscular arteries then lead to arterioles. And arterioles are much smaller here. Now we're talking about micrometers instead of centimeters or millimeters. The composition of an arteriole isn't percentage-wise that much different from a muscular artery. It's just smaller. The point of an arteriole and why we really need to appreciate arterioles is this is where most blood pressure regulation in the body occurs. And we'll get to blood pressure a little bit later here, but arterioles do most of the blood pressure regulating of the body, and that's really important.
arterioles connect to capillaries, and capillaries are even smaller than the arterioles were. And here we see a sudden change in composition of what makes it up. We have basically a lining of skin-like material, no elastic tissue, no smooth muscle, and no fibrous tissues because there's very low blood pressure here and we want the walls of the blood vessel to be very thin because these are actually going to be involved in exchange. Exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide occurs through the capillary. Uh, movement of fluids happens through the capillary wall. Movement of nutrients and waste products happen across the capillary wall. So only having that layer of tissue as a very thin layer there and not, nothing else in terms of elastic and smooth muscle and all that allows for that exchange to more efficiently occur. As blood leaves the capillaries it's headed towards the venous system so the venules pick up the blood from capillaries. They're getting a little bit bigger here and they're starting to add back in some of those other things. So smooth muscle and the fibrous tissue show up here again. Veins connect to venules. So lots of capillaries entered into a venule, multiple venules entered into a vein, and then veins all go back to the vena cava associated with the heart. Once we get to the vein we have all four tissue types present again and we're back in the realm of at least millimeters and some of the larger veins will get back up into the centimeters again as well. So we're back up to the relative size that we saw in the arterioles. If we look at what's called a capillary bed, and that is the capillaries you would find between an arteriole and the associated venule. So in the first example here, the sphincters are open. And what that means is that when blood comes out of the arteriole into the capillary bed, all of the capillaries get blood flow. This then oxygenates all of that tissue. It provides nutrients to all of that tissue and then provides trash takeaway service as well in the form of carbon dioxide and waste products. In some cases though, you don't want to provide blood flow through that entire capillary bed and in that case those sphincters would close, meaning that blood shoots from the arteriole straight through the middle to a venule and skips the capillary bed altogether. Under what circumstances might you find that to be the case? And why would you want that to happen? One possibility might be in the skin. And the skin's job is to do a number of things, but one of those is to assist with temperature regulation. So if the body is getting a little bit too cold, and you're sending lots of warm blood to all of the capillary beds of the skin, what you're doing is you're losing a lot of heat. So if a person's body temperature drops below a certain point, many of the capillary beds in the skin will close off like we see in scenario B here and send that blood back into the system to the core of the body saying the skin can do without as much of this blood right now. Let's keep this heat in the core of the body. The reverse would become true if the body became too warm. Certainly all of the sphincters would open in the skin capillary beds pumping as much hot blood close to the surface of the body as possible to lose as much heat as possible. So temperature regulation is one big reason why sphincters would open or close in a capillary bed. Another thing that can cause sphincters to close in capillary beds, especially the skin, is the idea of shock. And you'll read all about different kinds of shock later in the chapter in your reading assignment, but the effect is that many of the capillary beds get shut off. The thought there is to divert blood to the core of the body and keep things like the heart and lungs and liver and things like that supplied with blood, saying again, the skin can make do right now with less blood. The muscles can make do with a little bit less blood right now, but the heart, the liver, things like that really can't. So this is to divert blood to different parts of the body as part of an emergency response. This then provides an interesting opportunity to do a quick and dirty field test for shock. One thing you can do is assess the patient's mental condition. Do they appear to be aware of what's going on? Are they engaging in rational thought processes? Are they making sense? If the answer is no to any of those questions, that would suggest shock. One thing you can do, though, that is not subjective in any form or fashion is called a capillary refill test. 
So what needs to happen for a capillary refill test is to squeeze the blood out of the capillary bed and then see how long it takes for that bed to refill. If the sphincters are open, fully supplying the capillary bed with blood, that suggests probably not a whole lot of shock going on there. But if there's a lot of sphincter closing, in other words, a lot of diversion of blood away from capillary beds, that suggests that shock might in fact be what's happening. So a quick and dirty version of that is to find a part of the body, and the tip of the finger is a good place for this. So just do this real quick. Take a tip of one of your fingers and squeeze it. Then let off and count how long it takes that tissue at the tip of the finger to return to its normal color. So squeezing out the blood will make it pale and releasing the pressure allows the capillary beds to refill. And if it takes more than two to three seconds for that capillary bed to refill, that suggests some degree of sphincter closing and the capillary bed is not refilling at the rate you would like. That is a further indicator of perhaps shock. It doesn't have to be. It could just be your hands are cold and so you have poor circulation there right now as a temperature regulation mechanism. But it can also be along with those other indicators, possibly some evidence of shock. And shock probably is a bigger killer than most other medical problems so it's something that should be taken very seriously. When we look at all these different vessels throughout the body and where the blood is found, we find that most of the blood in the body is found in the veins and venules, so about 60%. This is not surprising because the veins and venules experience the lowest blood pressure of the body. They are the farthest away from the heart. So there would be more pooling of blood there than we would find in the blood vessels that were closer to the heart, like the arteries and the pulmonary blood vessels. Here we have a clogged pipe, and this is an old-fashioned metal plumbing pipe, probably from underneath someone's kitchen sink. And what you see there is a buildup of fat and other junk that's mostly clogged off this pipe, and this is probably around an 80% blockage of this pipe. A couple of questions to ask yourself here, and one is, how much is the flow of liquid restricted through that pipe? The second question is, what is the pressure at this point of blockage? And both of those are important. The amount of blood flow that remains is important to tissues on the other side of the blockage. The immediate location of blockage is concerned about the pressure. And you can see what happened here in this particular pipe is that right behind this blockage it blew out. Now that takes a pretty good amount of pressure to blow out a metal pipe. So what was happening was the pressure was building up back here behind this blockage. And the same sort of thing can happen in your blood vessels. So if your arteries start clogging up with fat and other junk because you're, perhaps your diet is not what it ought to be, your exercise isn't what it ought to be, and then it might start plugging up. So this is what a clogged artery might look like. And we'll label this probably in the neighborhood of a 75 to maybe 80% blockage here. And so there are some interesting calculations that go into determining blood flow and blood pressure at a blockage like this. Let's just say for argument's sake that the vessel in question has a 50% blockage. And you've heard about this before, especially with coronary arteries and people occasionally needing a coronary bypass procedure, they talk about the percent blockage. So a 50% blockage, half of that blood vessel is stopped up. What would that do to the blood flow past that point and to the blood pressure? How much would it change? Some of you right now are thinking perhaps, well, if it's half blocked, that means there's a 50% reduction in blood flow and perhaps a 50% increase in blood pressure. And that makes logical sense, but there's nothing logical about this equation. Don't ask me to explain the math, but the folks who have worked out the math on blocking off tubular structures like this, we discover that the blood flow for a 50% blockage is reduced to 1 16th the blood flow that it was before, and the blood pressure at that location is 16 times higher than it was before. So there's a 16 times change in pressure and volume with a 50% blockage. That means if you hear about someone having an 80% blockage, 
Now you're not saying, well, they have 20% that's livable. Now we're saying if 50% was a 16 times change, what's an 80%? And the answer is a much more significant number yet. So hearing about people with 80 to 90% or more blockages of coronary arteries, you often hear about that happening after the person experienced a heart attack. And the reason they experienced a heart attack was because of the blockage, so the loss of blood flow to that part of the heart. And occasionally you hear of someone in which they discovered that, but they hadn't yet had a heart attack, and that's just purely amazing. Interestingly, as a side note, it turns out that the younger you are when you experience a heart attack, the more likely you are to die from it. So if a 40-year-old male, let's say, experiences a heart attack, they most likely die, or at least get very close to that. If a 75-year-old male experiences a heart attack, it's probably an inconvenience, but life probably went on. So partially that has to do with the elasticity of vessels, and if you've been abusing your system to the point where a blood vessel clogs up that much, by the age of 40, let's say, compared to that same level of damage taking 75 years to occur, really the 75-year-old treated their body better. Additionally, older people just seem to be a little bit more flexible with loss of blood flow, and I don't really have good answers for why that is, but it just is. If we talk about blood pressure, we're talking about systemic blood pressure. Often measured at the arm, but ironically that at that point has lost some pressure. So if we look here at our two numbers, we have systolic pressure and we have diastolic pressure. Systolic pressure is the pressure of the blood in the blood vessel when the heart is actively pumping. The diastolic pressure occurs when the heart is relaxing and refilling with blood. So really what we're measuring is the highest and lowest blood pressures that occur in that particular blood vessel. The farther out you go from the heart, as we see in this diagram here, the lower the blood pressure becomes, and the closer the systolic and diastolic become. We're measuring blood pressure again out at the elbow, so we're getting out here a little bit towards the drop-off from the 120 over 80 mark. And again, the farther out we go, the lower those numbers become. I'll do another separate video where I'll demonstrate how to properly take someone's blood pressure and we'll go through some of the common mistakes that I see people make in taking blood pressures so that hopefully you'll do it correctly as a future healthcare provider. It is very important to properly take blood pressure because problems with pressure, either when it's too high or it's too low, can be quite significant to a person's ability to survive. So we want to eliminate as many mistakes as possible and I'll pontificate on that in a later video. We also talk about pulse. And pulse really is an indication of the heart rate. So when you feel someone's pulse, what you're really feeling is that particular artery expanding and contracting in relation to the heart, contracting and relaxing. So every time the heart contracts, it pushes blood through the entire system at a higher pressure, which causes that artery to expand. You would feel that then as a thumping underneath your finger as you're pressing on that spot. So a number of different places that can be done. My favorite place to take a pulse, to palpate a pulse, is at the common carotid artery. The reason for that is this is close to the heart, so you get a nice significant change in blood pressure there. It's relatively close to the surface of the skin, so it's easy to find. So it's a good strong pulse hard to miss. Uh, out at the radial artery probably is the most famous of the places to check a person's pulse, but again that's a fair bit of distance out from the heart, so the significance of the thumping or the detectability of that increase and decrease in artery diameter is going to be much more difficult to palpate. You can see again down there at the ankle and the top of the foot are other options, but again those are farther out as well. Another good one from having a good, strong, detectable pulse is the femoral artery. But as is suggested here by the picture, do be careful about taking someone's pulse at the femoral artery. As you might imagine, if you were to, without warning, stick your hand up into the genital region of a patient and press around in their feeling for the femoral artery, 
you might get a reaction from the patient that you weren't looking for. So if you do need to check the pulse at the femoral artery, do make sure that you're very clear to the patient, here's what I'm about to do, and here's where I'm about to do it at, so that there aren't any unexpected surprises. You might actually find uh, that you would get punched, <laughs> or otherwise have very serious problems with that patient if you just start feeling around in the groin region without good notification of what's going on. There's more than one pump in the body moving blood through it. And you think of the heart as the primary pump, and that's correct. But especially when you get to the veins in the legs, this is where we experience the lower blood pressures in the body. We experience the greatest effect of gravity on that blood. So if the heart pumps and then relaxes, then pumps again, gravity is going to try to take that blood, and, put, and it goes forward when the heart contracts, then when the heart relaxes, gravity tries to pull that blood right back down where it came from. If that occurred too much, then you would just slosh the blood back and forth in the lower legs, but it would never move forward. So the idea of a skeletal muscle pump is a really wonderful thing. And that is in the legs when those muscles are working, and really throughout the body this helps, but in the legs it's the most significant. When those muscles contract and shorten, they actually, as you can see in the picture, squeeze the blood vessel. That helps to push blood forward as well. So you have some local enhancing pumps in the skeletal muscles. Perhaps some of you worked in a factory before, or in really any setting where you're standing around on hard surfaces all day, and you find that your legs start swelling and hurting. That's because gravity is pooling the blood in the legs. If you were moving around, even on that hard surface, for the same amount of time, but moving, the skeletal muscle pumps would help to keep that blood circulated on through the system. We also see here another really handy thing, and that's the presence of venous valves. So just like in the heart, we had valves, and they were designed to make sure blood went forward, but didn't come backwards, we have the same sort of thing in veins. And so as we can see here in the picture, as blood would go forward, and then the heart would, let's say we pushed it through this valve here, the heart relaxes, now gravity says go back down, so blood starts to come back down, but then it closes that valve and stopped. Then the next time the heart beats, it pushes it out further to the next valve, then it stops. So it's moving blood forward, stop, forward, stop, forward, stop, which is better than forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards. So valves plus skeletal muscle contraction are really useful things to help the, blood, the heart, especially again in the legs. Varicose veins are a problem with valves not sealing like they're supposed to. So those valves are supposed to come together and close nice and tight. But if one or more of them pop open backwards, so they fail to seal for whatever reason, then blood can actually pool because the valves don't then prevent reverse flow. And so varicose veins are basically swollen veins in which the valves have failed. You would most commonly see this perhaps in someone with a sedentary lifestyle that wouldn't have a lot of skeletal muscle contraction going on to help with blood flow, so too much pressure on the veins. You might see this happen with very overweight people. As the blood tries to exit the legs and get back into the body, it uh, sort of gets blocked off with blood flow not able to go past the fat deposits. Pregnancy would be a temporary induction of this, perhaps. Uh, sitting a lot would be a problem here because you would be bent at the knee, which causes the blood vessels going through the knee to be somewhat kinked off and constricted. So the more physically active a person is, the less overweight they are, probably the better off you're going to be from a vein health perspective. Solutions for varicose veins, and they can be quite painful because the vein is being stretched quite a bit. They can also be quite unsightly, popping up under the skin. They can be coiled and kinked and twisted and, and be all kinds of cosmetically unappealing. So the solution can be a number of things, but one thing they might do is a procedure called venous closure. And that's going to involve some vein stripping. In other words, running a device through that vessel and then pulling it back out. And as they pull it back out, it grabs the valves and pops them back into position again. Hopefully then they would close in an appropriate way after they're returned to their proper position. 
some local surgeons perform that procedure, and they like to advertise that within two days or so, you'll be back to your normal activity levels again. I don't know if it's quite that perfect, but at least it would certainly improve the situation. Some veins might actually just be surgically removed. Sometimes it's easier to take them out than it is to try to get everything straightened back out inside. Better yet, though, is just be physically active, physically healthy, avoid being overweight, avoid sitting too much, and you probably won't have much issue with this. We've been talking about blood pressure off and on here, so there are a couple of things that impact blood pressure. And those are, across the top here, stroke volume and heart rate. Remember, those were part of the cardiac output formula. Peripheral resistance is the other piece of this puzzle, and that has to do with what is the diameter of the blood vessel, how runny or thick is the blood, and how much blood vessel is there you have to push the blood through. All five of these things are involved in the process, but I'm going to propose that the three most significant are heart rate, diameter of blood vessels, and blood vessel length. If the heart rate goes up, that means cardiac output went up. That means blood pressure went up. If the diameter of blood vessels gets smaller, that means there's more resistance. There's more pressure because you're trying to put the same amount of fluid now through a smaller opening. If blood vessel length increases, that means you have more pressure, you have more resistance from more blood vessel that you have to push the blood past. So blood viscosity and stroke volume are part of the equation, but heart rate, blood vessel diameter, and blood vessel length are the most important. Heart rate you really can't do a whole lot about other than adjust your physical activity and try to get healthier. Diameter of blood vessels you really can't do a whole lot about because that's automatically controlled. Blood viscosity you could impact, so if you drink more water that would help with that. But blood vessel length is really something that you can do something about. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but it's an incredible amount of blood vessel length that it takes to supply one pound of fat with an adequate blood supply. So fat's actually kind of greedy when it comes to a blood supply. So for every pound of fat you lose, you eliminate hundreds and hundreds of feet of blood vessels. If you reduce the number of blood vessels in your body by hundreds of feet, let's say you lose, let's say, 500 feet of blood vessel for one pound of fat, you lose 10 pounds of fat, so there we just decreased the amount of blood vessel in the body by about a mile. If you have to push blood a mile less, clearly you can do that with a lower pressure. So one thing that overweight people can do to help with blood pressure is to lose weight. That then means you don't have to push the blood as far, so peripheral resistance went down, mean arterial blood pressure can go down. Your heart rate will actually go down too, so you get a double dose of blood vessel length was down and heart rate was down because you didn't have as much distance to go to push the blood, so you get a two-for-one special there. My blood pressure on an average day probably runs somewhere in the 130 over 80 range, which is a tad bit on the high side. If I would lose the weight that I want to lose, so right now I'm clocking in around 243 pounds, I think it is. If I would get down to 200 pounds, which is where I would like to be, that would be removing 43 pounds of fat. So that would be a significant reduction in blood vessel length which would then translate to my average blood pressure probably being fabulous. Not a little on the high side, but absolutely fabulous. Uh, and probably when my blood pressure was high, then it would enter the 130 range. We'll see how this summer goes as to whether or not I'm able to lose that 40-something pounds. But if I do that, it will have a definite positive impact on my blood pressure. A number of different hormones are involved in regulating blood pressure. And I said that most blood pressure regulation occurred with the arterioles, with adjusting their diameter. So if they increase their diameter even 1-2%, to 2 that can have a significant measurable effect on blood pressure system-wide. So we have epinephrine here. We have angiotensin, antidiuretic hormone, and a number of others here. And most of them, as you see over on the right, 
most of them alter arterial size, either with vasoconstriction or with vasodilation. So uh, increasing and decreasing the size of the arterioles, even by a small amount, makes a big difference in blood pressure. And that's something that's being taken care of 24-7. Your arterioles are constantly adjusting their size to keep your blood pressure where it needs to be based on your activities. If you're up and moving around, your blood pressure needs to be higher to support that activity. If you're sitting down, you don't need that much pressure to keep blood flowing to support that activity. And the gravity is not having as much as an oppositional effect on blood returning to the heart. So sitting down, not being active is going to probably allow the arterioles to dilate some and lower your blood pressure. If you're up and moving around, the arterioles are going to vasoconstrict, which will raise your blood pressure. If we look at flow of blood through the body during different activities, so at rest, let's say on the left here, total blood flow 5,800 milliliters per minute. So just under 6,000 milliliters of blood being circulated per minute at rest. Of that, the brain gets 750, the heart 250, skeletal muscles 1200, and you can read. If we compare that to active strenuous exercise, we now see a total blood flow of approaching 18,000 milliliters per minute. So we've about tripled the blood flow through the body. And if we compare the brain, the brain didn't really change from at rest to exercise levels because the brain doesn't really change its activity level that much when you're active versus not being active. So its consumption of oxygen stays pretty much the same. The heart though, because it's pumping a lot more blood, also approximately triples its uh, oxygen needs and its blood supply. Skeletal muscles are what's moving you in that exercise. So you would go from 1200 to a little over 12,000. Pretty significant change there, about, about a 10 times change in blood flow there. Your skin was 500 at rest and 1900 during exercise, so it actually went up as well. And this might be a little bit of a surprise to you, but the simple answer is you need more cooling. When you're engaging in strenuous exercise, the body's heating up. If you increase blood flow to the skin, that helps to cool you off during that activity. So that makes sense, actually. The kidneys were 1,100 at rest, and now they're only 600 at an exercise scenario. As we also find with the abdomen, so that would be small and large intestine, stomach, liver, pancreas, things like that. 1,400 at rest, 600 during activity. Other, so 600 at rest, 400 during activity. So those reductions we see are a result of the body saying, we can turn that off for now. We can do without that for now. So let's reduce the blood flow, reduce its activity levels, and emphasize putting that blood back into the muscles, into the skin, into the heart, where we needed it more. And let's also spend our energy on those other things. Later, after exercise, we can come back and fully activate the digestive system again. We can fully activate the immune system again. Those things can wait for now. We'll come back to it later and restore the blood flow. So that's the general idea as to why things would change. I'm not going to go into great detail here on the vasodilators and the vasoconstrictors, but do understand that, again, we looked at that chart, and there are a number of other things that impact vasodilation or vasoconstriction. Metabolic changes, like changes in oxygen and carbon dioxide levels, will do have uh, effects on uh, vasodilation specifically. Uh, we can have hormonal effects. Uh, so lots of different things involved in the process here. Just understand that it's a complicated system. Capillaries, as we mentioned earlier, are there for exchange, which means they need to be leaky. And when you read about the different kinds of capillaries in your reading assignment, you would have read about fenestrated capillaries and continuous capillaries, and, and they had different levels of leakiness. But what we're interested in here is exactly how do things move in and out of a red blood or a capillary. 
So if we look at the wall of the capillary here, we see a couple of options. And option one is diffusion. So if it is a lipid-soluble something, like a hormone, for example, that can easily diffuse across a lipid-based membrane. If you're not lipid-based, though, you have to use some other route. So option two is movement through an intercellular cleft. This is basically a gap between the cells making up the membrane here. So if the cells are loosely assembled, things could slide through there. Option three is to move through a fenestration. That was one of those little pores, those little openings there. So some things, again, these are mostly water-soluble things, will simply go through the pore. Option four is vesicular transport. If you remember the idea of exocytosis and endocytosis that we would have talked about back at the beginning of Anatomy 1, that was movement of things into or out of a cell by forming little membrane-bound packages and either swallowing something by wrapping membrane around it or spitting it out by wrapping it in a membrane package and then fusing with the outer surface. So that's also an option for moving things in and out of capillaries as well. So we said capillaries are leaking things. And that's so that we can have fluid exchange and that sort of thing. In this process of determining how much stuff actually leaks out of capillaries, we talk about pressure. We would have hydrostatic pressure, and that's basically blood pressure. We can also have osmotic pressure, and that is what is the salt concentration on one side of the, of the capillary wall compared to the salt concentration on the other side of the capillary wall. Keep in mind it can be things other than salt, like sugar and other solutes. Uh, but it's looking at concentration of dissolved particles on one side of the capillary wall versus the other side. So what we see here is that blood comes in from the capillary, or into the capillaries rather, from the arteriole at reasonably high pressure. As it goes through the capillaries, the pressure goes down. And what we see here is that about 20 liters of fluid a day comes out of the capillary beds into the surrounding tissues. Now that's about seven times the total liquid amount of blood that you had in the first place. So obviously we can't leave all 20 liters out there in the tissues, or you'll simply run out of blood. So if 20 liters goes out, that's mostly hydrostatic pressure, the blood pressure driving it. The question is how much fluid goes back into the capillary bed on the second half? So most of the first half of the capillary bed here is movement out. Much of the effect on the second half of the capillary bed can be moving back in, or we might also have things moving out still as well. So it all depends on osmotic pressure at that point. So we're going to say that 20 liters come out of the capillaries per day, and about 17 liters come back into the capillaries per day. So we're recovering most of that fluid that goes out, but some of it, that approximately three liters or so, does not get reabsorbed by the capillaries. They're not salty enough, and there's not enough pressure to push all of it back in. So that will lead us to the idea of the lymphatic system. The job of the lymphatic system is to pick up the other three liters and to do something with it. We'll talk about that in the next chapter. But for now, we'll just say the lymphatic system takes care of the fluid that the capillary beds did not recapture themselves. Here we have an example of pretty serious edema. Edema is swelling, and in this case, this is going to be called pitting edema, because what you do in the first picture there is squeeze that area, just like you're doing a capillary refill test, and what that does is it squeezes fluid out of that particular area of tissue. So what's going on here is that fluid is coming out of the capillary beds, but it's not being picked up at the same rate as being dumped out. So we have a net accumulation of fluid in the tissues surrounding the blood vessels. So squeezing it will press the fluid out of that particular section of tissue. And after you release, we see on the right here, just like with the capillary refill test of how long did it take to refill the capillaries, here we're looking at how long does it take for that fluid to redistribute itself throughout that tissue. 
And when it leaves a visible pit behind, after you remove your finger, that means the pressure in there is so high that it's not really moving easily. And so it takes a while for that swelling to redistribute itself. And that tells you at that point you've got something that you really need to work with. This is not mild inflammation. This is ser a serious problem that can actually interfere with blood flow. And if you let this sort of thing go too long, you can have weeping of the skin when fluid actually starts sort of oozing out of the skin because the pressure inside is so high. We also start to see loss of proper blood flow. So if you let this sort of problem go too long and the blood flow stops too much, you can have the onset of tissue damage and gangrene. So you might actually have a person lose a foot because it was too swollen for too long and it didn't get a good blood supply and it died. You know, that is quite a serious scenario. And this is something that diabetics especially have a lot of problems with because diabetics have kidneys that don't do a good job of regulating the system hormonally. But either way, when you have a patient with pitting edema, that is a patient who needs help. Sometimes you might utilize things like compression socks that helps to prevent the tissue from swelling too much by increasing external pressures. You might have the patient elevate their feet so gravity helps pull the fluid out rather than trying to keep the fluid in. Perhaps the person needs to cut back on the salt content of their diet. Some people's bodies don't do a good job of getting rid of salt and it can lead to this sort of problem. So in that sort of scenario, look at elevating feet, increase pressure, decrease salt intake in the body, and that will probably provide some degree of benefit. Doctors often prescribe as well diuretic medications to tell the kidneys to dump fluid from the body and it will then suck the fluid out of, in this case, the feet and redistribute throughout the rest of the body. That's really treating a symptom rather than figuring out the underlying cause though, so I wouldn't necessarily consider that fixing the problem, but simply kicking the can a little further down the road. For the rest of these slides here, I don't necessarily want you to memorize all these arteries and all these veins, but I do want you to appreciate the degree to which the body is vascularized. So, so that really means what kind of blood supply does the body have? And we'll find that everywhere throughout the body has significant arterial blood supply. So let's just go through that. Head and neck from the side, lots of big arteries there. If we look at the brain, the brain has, we can see here, a very significant arterial blood supply. Looking at the brain from the bottom side, that's the supply lines we would have seen for the previous image, so quite a bit of that. The brain requires a significant blood supply because it consumes large amounts of oxygen. So you always want the brain to have good blood flow. If we look at the arms here, Nice big arteries going through the arms. The stomach and liver has its own blood supply here. Pretty significant lines there. The kidneys, pretty good sized plumbing there. The digestive system, the outside of the stomach and liver. So here we're looking at large and small intestines having a pretty solid blood supply as well. The leg, as we would expect, looks much like the arm. Lower leg, good supply there. Now remember all of those patterns of artery distribution throughout the body. And now what you're seeing in blue are veins. And what you should see is that the pictures look very, very similar. When we look at the head, it looks almost exactly like the arteries did. So the point we're making here is that everywhere you have an artery go to take blood out, you need to have a vein to take that blood back in. So the artery map of the body and the vein map of the body should line up almost exactly on top of each other throughout the entire body. And we'll see that that is in fact the case. Hopefully that was very informative and you now know a lot more than you did before. I'll see you next time.